Now back to the geeky stuff. So uh, I wanted to talk to you today a bit about something that I've been doing a lot in different workplaces, and it's annoying people. No, um, it's um, building APIs. I've worked at Fairfax, uh, a little startup called Trunk, and now I'm at Lexa, as uh, we've previously said. And I'll just, let me just, uh, L-E-X-E-R dot I-O, because I, no one can understand me when I, <laughs> no one can understand me when I say it. Um, That's an awesome website. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why is that broken? I was, it says I'm on the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Tab. yeah, tab? In the first tab, you have to Yeah. Uh, ooh. Yeah. No. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I don't care. I'm, I'm so far from caring. Um, L-E-X-E-R dot I-O. Apparently, people can't understand me when I, when I speak. It might be the beer. L L-E-X-E-R. Lexer. So it's not Lexar with the A, which is the guys who make the dinky um, thumb drives and stuff. Uh, it's oh, Lexus. Oh, don't make me come down there. <laughs> Goodness gracious. It's a sci-fi show from the 90s, right? Oh, God. No one's getting home at this rate. Um, Alexa, yeah. <laughs> this has turned into improv. This is ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> this is all your fault. <laughs> um, this is supposed to be dry and geeky. Um, so, uh, all of these companies build stuff in a fairly decentralised way. Um, Fairfax has a bunch of random systems sprinkled all over the place that need to talk to each other, a lot of old things, a lot of new things, all sorts of crazy shit. Um, Trunk was a startup that wanted to be aggressively decentralised from the start um, and... Lexa is kind of in between. They know that they need to decentralise stuff. They haven't decentralised as much as they would like. And so for all of these places, I've recommended um, stepping away from Rails for API building and just trying to strip it right back to the bare minimum. Get right down to Rack, if you can, for like a single endpoint or whatever, and you've heard me talk about this before probably. Um, and if you need something a little bit more sophisticated, step up to something like Grape which doesn't have all the weight of Rails, but is a bit more sophisticated, has a nice DSL, and, yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm not going to talk too much about Grape while I'm here um, because I've talked about it a bit before, um, but you can kind of see that we can make a, a class, inherits from Grape API. Um, we've got some helpers and stuff. You can see I've got some global data up the top uh, and, yeah, some, some more helper methods to find, but ultimately the meat of it is a little bit like in Rails when we're defining our routes, um, we have this sort of recursive DSL where we describe resources and verbs, basically. Ultimately, it gets down to a hierarchy of, of HTTP verbs and some Ruby code that we hang at those levels. Uh, so we can have gets and deletes and posts and puts and everything. Um, we have little Ru uh, Ruby helper functions inside that do whatever we need to do. Uh, or we leverage Grape's behaviour to um, return error messages in a HTTP kind of way. So that's fine. Like, this stuff is all really pretty run-of-the-mill and whatever the Ruby framework you're using to build this kind of stuff, it will sort of look a bit similar. A Sinatra app can look very much like this. Um, a Rack app can look very much like this. Rails, ultimately, when you cook down all of the crazy shit that's sprinkled everywhere in the, in the file structure, ultimately gets, gets down to something very much like this. So it's fine. Uh, we, the grape specific stuff is that we mount this as kind of a hierarchy. And so we have a, we have a, a, a grape API module at the root, which then mounts the other stuff. And it's nice. You can it very much follows the rape, uh, rape rack. Grape follows the rack pattern. Wow. Um, Grape follows the rack pattern of mounting things hierarchically and having sort of this middleware pattern of trick, uh, requests trickling down through the structure, which is fine. But how do you share this with people? How do you expose this? How do you document it so people can understand what's going on? Um, anyone who's used the Twitter API or I think the Facebook one does this as well, they actually have this really cool interactive documentation you can fiddle with and poke at and like feed in your authentication token, get results back out. It makes it incredibly quick and easy to uh, understand 
an API. And so it would be really cool if we could get that kind of behavior on tap. Um, and that's what Swagger is for. So, so Grape gives you your entire API as this sort of recursive structure. And then Swagger can introspect that structure and give you some information about it so that you can document it. Just cool, okay, so what does that look like? Well, it's literally this simple. Into the root uh, grape module that we have here, we literally add Swagger documentation, that's literally what it's called, and that just comes out of this uh, grape uh, Swagger gem that we have up here, and that's it. Job done. We now have documentation across our entire API. What does that look like, you say? Well, it's very simple. It's this blob of JSON. Uh, so there's some uh, metadata at the top, and then we have this hierarchical structure, um, which I will make bigger, um, that reflects everything that was previously in that grape structure. Uh, we have routes for authors, we can get them, it produces stuff. This is fairly sparse because my example grape stuff is very, very simple. The more useful information about parameters and return types and error types and various other things you put into grape, the more gets reflected out into Swagger and your documentation becomes richer and richer as you make your API more meaningful. <laughs> so, job done. Anyone can read this, right? No? Okay. So this is not that friendly. What we really want is this. So this is the other part of Swagger. Swagger, the uh, grape integration, generates the JSON. This is Swagger UI, which is a, a sort of a single page app kind of javascript -y kind of thing um, that consumes that JSON file. As you can see, I don't know if it's going to be hard to see the um, URL. The URL is the domain name of, of a standing version of this interface, and then the parameter is just URL localhost 9292 where my grape application is running currently and slash swagger doc because that's how you get the that JavaScript blob that JSON blob uh, so this consumes that JSON blob and renders out a really nice web interface where we can literally like fold this open and say oh so what does get on slash authors actually do oh well here it is this is, the res this is the response body that's come live from my Grape application right now. Um, so it's literally that easy. You can go down, you can say, oh, you know, I want to create a new one. Should I try and create a new one on the fly? This is going to blow up in my face. I just know it. Uh, let's try it out. What the hell? Um, uh, try Ruby. Uh, go. Uh, do anything? We did, so one of the nice things it does is actually describes the HTTP command that it's gonna do as a curl command. So you can literally copy this out and paste it into a terminal and try it out for yourself. Oh, I guess we kind of, did we create a, let's get a list of all the authors currently in the system. Huh. Uh, there is, yeah, okay, I've screwed that up. So that's, um, a, I've, oh no, I, yeah, sorry. I created an author I meant to create a book, but. Yeah, so we've created an author, and it's now there in the list. So this is incredible. Like, you can give this to anyone and say, oh, I've built an API, it does those fancy things, you can do the things, blah, blah, blah. And people say, well, like, I don't even, I, I can't even, like, what is that? But you can hand them this and say, use your, put in your username and password at the top and step into the API, start poking at it, and away you go. I was working on a project recently uh, with a startup and we put this interface in front of the API that they were using and immediately like project managers and, and support people could step in here and say like the user interface doesn't work but I can verify that the information that I was expecting to be in the system is in the system. I can search for a, for a user and actually see that they actually, that the interface worked, like the user went into the system but this, the um, display screwed up. Like we're still working with the developers to get that right but the information is there. Or, as I was, I was talking to my coworkers about this, they're like, you know, we can um, diagnose bugs in the API by poking at this and saying, yeah, the information, not only does the information not appear in the app, but actually it's not in the API either. So, you know, th that's why it's not in the app. It's not because there's a glitch in the app. So they can help you diagnose problems, which is incredible. Like, brings the bar way down on exploring your APIs and, and working out what's available in them, 
what could be useful, what needs to be added, all sorts of stuff. So it's, it's an incredible democratizer of, of the systems that you're building. Most of the time. So um, it says petstore.swagger.io. Uh, .swag uh, so this is the publicly hosted version of the Swagger UI that the Swagger people actually provide. Um, they give you the, the, uh, an NPM package to build this and run it yourself. I can't build this. Um, the NPM package uh, requires node 6, uh, and I'm already on 7.8, which is 7.8, which is the standard one that comes out now. So it's, it's not perfect. Like, I'm, I'm prodding them now to try and, like, get them to, uh, like, make it a bit less trailing in the, in the past. But, yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's that problem. Like, you can use this version, you can use the public version, and you can probably, if you dial back your node version, you can get the, the build process working and you can customise it and do all sorts of cool stuff. But first, that was the first thing I hit. So your mileage may vary. Which, does anyone here not know what YMMV stands for? Yeah? Yeah, okay. One of my coworkers didn't. I was, like, totally blown away. Um, so... This is all pretty cool. It intro introspects my Grape API automatically. Nice. Um, how well does it do that, you might ask, um, or I'm going to ask for you anyway. Um, so with limited success, um, one interesting example is down here we've got uh, the process for creating a book. Host a book, which creates a book with some parameters. I had this clever idea that I put author ID in here, and I was like, wait a minute, validation of author ID should be author ID is only in the list of IDs for the authors. Okay, cool. Um, so I was like, I've got a helper method called author. Um, I'll just map across that, pull out all the IDs, and that's the values that are acceptable. And that exploded in my face. Um, the helper methods that I've created up here, so where are they? Like. Um, deaf book and deaf author, uh, books and authors, they're not available in the validation block uh, because of the magical way that Grape turns this module of code into a live running set of code. Lesson here to everyone, um, metaprogramming, use it in moderation because you can screw people so much with stuff like this. As soon as anyone tries to use your system in a way that you didn't imagine, you're clever metaprogramming screws them. So I'm actually having to go back to the global variable um, and retrieve the list of authors from there instead. So Grape has not done quite what I hoped then. Um, what is it using for validation? It's got its own internal validation machinery, uh, which behaves a lot like the stuff that's in Active Record or Active Model. Yeah, Active Model. But that's cool. OK, so it can, it can validate stuff. Good. Um, uh, let's have a look at what that looks like actually in the code. Uh, oh, sorry, I need to restart. This is all live, you can see, because shit's breaking all the time. Um, so let me just reload this and let's have a look. Here we go. So when we try to post to uh, a book, we're going to try and create one. And here we go. It's actually represented our, um, our validation rule here. Uh, it's an enum, and it's... So the only acceptable value for creating... for the author ID when we create a book is this exact value. Anyone see a problem here? What happens if I add a new author? There will be a different author ID. This rule will not cover that. So this documentation is, instantly becomes invalid as soon as I add another author to the system. What's happened, of course, is that um, Swagger has this brilliant idea that this validation rule is somehow static and can be run once when the validation, when the uh, documentation is being generated, and then that represents all potential values that could possi possibly exist, which is, of course, stupid. It's, it's really the problem is I've misunderstood how the validation stuff works or they've misrepresented it. It's like we can both be stupid. We can both be wrong. Um, and so that sort of stuff is really interesting to catch, and then you start to look at stuff like this where Swagger the Swagger gem can collect extra configuration, uh, configuration stuff off, the, um, off these sorts of um, constraints. And you can say, well, wait, like for the values part of this, just 
nil. Don't, don't try and do anything. And so when we when we restart it, that particular constraint goes away. So there's no longer any enums in this documentation. There's not that stupid constraint. But this is one. It's a classic example uh, where grape is really really useful at a particular level of sophistication for simple mid-level kind of um, APIs with the constraints, the, um, the validation and stuff is relatively simple and it doesn't involve lots of clever introspection and stuff. Um, it can get you a long way, but simpler than that, just use Rack. And more complicated than that, Grape's actually probably gonna get in the way and you're probably better off using something a bit more sophisticated. So I would say, do you swagger consider whether or not you want to use Grape. Because <laughs> in the process of pre preparing this talk, I'm kind of like, Grape's awesome for what I do, but I can't in good conscience recommend it to everyone for every single sort of API. Um, but Swagger is excellent because um, the experience of using like the Twitter documentation or any of those, those other things, um, using something like this to introspect an API and explore it is invaluable. It gets developers up to speed really fast. It gets other people in your company uh, aware of what APIs have in them and what they can do really, really quickly. And then when you expose this out, you save yourself a zillion hours of support time where people are like, can your API do this? Can it do that? And I'm like, try it. Can it do it? Like, look at the parameters. You know, normally paging <laughs> options and they have, you can put in some rate limiting information and for any, anything else. Your you get documentation for free and say that to any developer and they immediately get excited. Um, so yeah, I think, Grape is pretty good and Swagger is excellent. Definitely use it. Would use again. Questions? Like what? Oh. Have I used any of the surrounding edit, uh, tooling around Swagger, like Swagger Editor and Swagger Extensions? I haven't actually. Um, I'm still working on convincing companies to, to embed this into their workflow. Um, varying degrees of success. So question over here. So I already used it. Have you considered using Ruby GraphQL? I have used a quite a bit of GraphQL. Sorry. Um, have I used Ruby GraphQL? Um, I have used quite a bit of GraphQL. Um, I haven't used a lot of Ruby GraphQL. Uh, it's, it's kind of a different space because um, this is very much focused on raw, like straight to the point, simple HTTP or RESTful. Let's, let's. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I mean, there's no reason you can't use cursors and stuff in this to, to be getting exactly the information that you want. There's another tool called Graph, GraphQL that gives you a similar approach to this that allows you to explore the, explore the API and gives you documentation as well. Cool. Did, did any, every, uh, uh, GraphQL, GraphQL is a tool that gives you this sort of uh, exposure across um, a GraphQL yeah, interface. Yeah, GraphQL. GraphQL is interesting. It's in a slightly different um, problem domain to this because, uh, yeah, as I said, this is very simple RESTful-based stuff. Uh, and my experience with all APIs that I've worked on is that GraphQL is a solution in search of a problem. Your mileage may vary. Um, any other questions? Yep. I do. <laughs> Um, why do I uh, complain about the weight of Rails and work steadily to strip down to... It's not the word we use. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Um, sorry? What was that? Oh, okay. Why do I shit on Rails? Um, <laughs> Rails is a really, really good toolkit for building mid-sized web applications. Um, and to use it for anything else is somewhat to fight its intention. And so I really like using Rails for mid-sized websites and I do use it for web, uh, mid-sized websites. I discourage people from using it for a single verb, um, particularly if they have no database behind it uh, because what the fuck are you doing? Um, and similarly, I, I wouldn't recommend it for Gmail. Uh, I would recommend an API and a single page app and you know something much more targeted. Um, Rails comes battery included. It's got a lot of um, useful stuff in it. Uh, it's also got a lot of weird 
not quite Ruby para, um, paradigms in it or like what's the patterns, code patterns in it. And so while it's gotten quite a few people quickly up to speed with uh, websites and to a lesser extent Ruby, ultimately I feel like it can poison people beyond a certain level of sophistication in the right way to build things in Ruby. Um, MVC is a great pattern. It's not necessarily the way everyone's doing everything these days. Um, Active Record has a tremendous amount of power. It's not necessarily the right solution for most of the things people use it for. Um, so I encourage people to be a bit more agile in, in what they approach. If they want to do something that suits Rails, they should use Rails. If they want a single verb, use Rack. If they want to build an API, use Grape. If they, you know, if they want to do Node, they should probably be doing Node. Like, there's there's a sweet spot for everything. Um, and yeah, as I was saying, Grape is certainly not. Uh, it's, it's got a sweet spot as well, and it's not Twitter, as they found out. Um, Ruby is not the sweet spot for Twitter. Um, and it's not correct for a single verb either. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I couldn't find anything else. Oh, sorry. Um, why grape and not anything else? I couldn't find anything else. I actually, I was got, I got so jack of grape while I was doing this. A presentation for uh, preparing for this presentation, that I actually went and tried to find anything better, and I couldn't find anything better. Um, things like Sinatra give you some tools that you can then use for APIs, but it's not API native. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rails is getting closer with Rails API and stuff, but it still brings a lot of baggage. So, and there's a lot of other things that like there's there's stuff where you can like reflect your model out as a as a rack endpoint. And stuff, but it's like I don't even know what I'm building anymore. Like, am I building a model that fell onto the internet, or am I building like a rack thing that that gets all of its configuration from my model? Or like, I don't even know anymore. Um, so, Grape, in that sense, has a really good division of labor between what the model is, uh, the very good exposure for the rack middleware and stuff, and then Grape does some controllery stuff in the middle that's that's quite graceful for for what it does. Um, do you have any other APIs that you would, uh, gems that you would recommend? Okay, yeah, cool. So my coworkers tend to build things in Sinatra because they don't know any better. Um, no. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it's, it depends on, to some extent, it's what you're familiar with. And, and that's why there's a lot of APIs built in Rails because people start there and they say, we need a little bit of API on the side of our website. And then it, you end up with what we have, which is we have a tiny bit of website on the side of our API, which is sort of ridiculous. It's like... Domain and Fairfax. It's like, who who is running who? Um, yeah. Anyway, any other questions? Yeah. Did you have any luck with the Swagger generator with um, maybe a little bit more metaprogramming for the API? Just say stop repeating the CRUD endpoints for the API. CRUD endpoints for the for the model. Could I do metaprogramming to make it simpler? Interesting. Um, are you talking about specifically like the fact that I've got a resources block for, for each of the models? Yeah, with, with similar parameters in them. So if, yep. if you uh, if you not so much by metaprogram, could you still be able to generate the great dots? Ah, oh, right. Uh, that's a really good question. I I don't know. Um, the interesting thing is that this code example comes from something that's more metaprogrammy, and I and I made it more explicit uh, to to make it more readable. Um, but in that version, I'm I'm not sure that I have Swagger plugged into that version. Um, it's a really interesting question. I think it would parse the classes and do the metaprogramming step first, and then it would do the introspection step. Um, and so one of the weird kind of weaknesses of Grape kind of becomes a strength at that point. Like it try, doesn't try and introspect until it has all of the, the code generated. So I think that would work. Um, certainly, as you can see, I'm like obsessively doing stupid metaprogramming stuff just to save myself like four methods or whatever because um, I'm that kind of geek. Um, and, yeah, I think you could definitely be that silly um, in this uh, yeah, 
I would definitely recommend being more explicit if you can. This is something that turns up in testing as well. Um, there's there's a definitely a threshold. There's a law of dimin diminishing returns with how indirect you can make your code before it becomes one meaningless string of Ruby that generates your program when you, you run it and then runs it. Like, try to be aware of your the, the comfort and, and um, happiness of your co-workers before you turn your entire program into one big blob of metaprogramming. But you can, if you want. And I obviously struggle to resist that urge. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, does anyone know what a Hattios link is before I answer? Um, does, <laughs> does, yeah, um, does Grape have anything for the thing that he's talking about? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Go and have a look and find out, um, and then tell us. Um, ah, I'm being lured into a trap. <laughs> Very, very badly. Um, so, come back with a full ass trap. That was a half ass trap. Um, so, any other questions? Yep. Trivially. Um, uh, can you stick this uh, UI componentry into your own website? And the answer is trivially. Um, because you can get the whole packages uh, from NPM, render it out, and then just host it wherever you like. This is the default version, and it's just like, this is literally what comes out of their documentation with, out of that package after you've just run you know, like NPM build or whatever, and they've just pushed it up to S3 or whatever. Unfortunately, you do need Node 6 to do the build at the moment. Um, hopefully, they'll, they'll fix that soon. But, you know, we run old versions of Ruby to run websites. We can run an old version of Node. <laughs> Anything? Yeah, can we go to the bar now? Yes? Thank you all for your time. <laughs>